Good evening, everyone, and lovely, lovely to have you all here. Um, I hope you appreciate the setup. We've made it all inclusive tonight because we really want to hear from you. Um, lovely to have you all here. Uh, this is an exclusive event for our box holders, our 1873 members and our club members. So very, very welcome. Um, we've got a cracking evening ahead. We're going to hear from George and Sean first, um, and then I'm going to come up with my good mate, James Forrester, and we're going to talk about the men's game and the women's game. Um, and then we're going to open the, 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 the questions up to you. Um, so sit back and enjoy, and uh, we'll have a great night. Cheers, all. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, George, should we dive right in? Um, so let's start with a general reflection on the season. Europe's gone well, Prem Cup's gone well, but the league, it clearly isn't where we want it to be. No, um, that's, that's a fair summary. I think, I think what's important is... Uh, what's, uh, we can have a sense of humour, can't we? Right, OK. Um, I think what's important when, when we look at, um, let's say, what I could do better uh, this season is, I think it's important to go back to sort of Christmas last year because I think up until that point, we were making good progress, I felt... Um, we were building a good squad. We were playing well. We were layering on top of um, a, a good defensive set-piece kicking game. And we came out the blocks that season really well. Won some games. Felt we were in a good spot. And then, obviously, we got halfway through that year. And for whatever reason, we started dropping like flies. We ended up with 13 major surgeries as well as a lot of other lads. And a lot of key positions. You know, Hooker was the, the glaringly obvious one. We ended up with three um, top-class hookers all injured, all out for the season. So at the end of last season, one of our big things was to reflect on how did that happen because it was blown out of no other team had dealt with anything like that. And we had to look at, you know, where, where could we be better? It's very difficult with injuries to pinpoint exactly what, but the number that we had, um, albeit they weren't correlated to, to the similar injuries, you know, we had to work out a way of dealing with that. So we... Spent the summer talking to other clubs, visiting other clubs, talking to people, looking at our programme. Um, you know, how are we going to, if we can affect something, how are we going to affect it? So the long and short of it was the bit we came to the conclusion across the medical coach in s and um, a lot of work was last season we went after um, post-contact metres. So we weren't very high in that. And... Ultimately, if you've got good ball carriers on the field, that sort of takes care of itself. But if you've got some players who need to work on that, we felt if we target that, that would push us on last season. And we figured if there's one thing we could take out the programme, it would probably be the volume of going after that. Because obviously, if you go after that, you are planting your foot a lot. You're driving through things a lot. We obviously put a lot of emphasis on scrum, mall. So we looked at the balance and said, right, we'll take out volume here, here, here. And we put a bigger focus on um, rest and recovery. And, you know, I won't get away from... We were scarred after last season because we did feel we were in a really good spot and we felt like it was um, taken away and sort of chasing our tail. And it was very hard for the players as well, watching player go down, player go down. And as much as we focused on staying motivated and keep being positive, very difficult situation. So... I think we, we reacted to that and, as I say, we focused on rest, recovery, extra days off, less training, take the bulk out of some of that physical training. And also the other emphasis was we know we've got to build our attack. We've known that's for a couple of years. That is the area that we've fallen short. So take the volume out of that, focus on the attack, and we feel those two things will hopefully keep us fit but also kick us on as a programme. And... It started pretty well. We had a very good pre-season. Um, boys bonded really well, worked really hard. The attack stuff was coming through nicely. And we got through pre-season without losing any bodies. So felt we were in a really good spot. Played the Prem Cup. Um, by the time we got to Newcastle away, we had a few weeks... Sorry, post-Newcastle away, we'd had a few weeks of um, a few key players dropping out. Uh, Val... Um, Ruan, Adam, and then Zach post um, Newcastle away. Obviously, he was out the fold as well. So, in reflection for me, what, what 
what could I have identified then? I could have identified our three biggest uh, carriers aren't on the field. Um, our playmakers no longer on the field. We've now got young nine and ten running the show. And, you know, to be fair to Jack Clement, I thought he's been outstanding and, and stood up. But he, he was our only guy who could get us over the game line. And we tried to carry on with that, you know, forcing that shape. You've got to make some dents in the middle to get the ball wide to the fast guys. And we went a little bit too long with that. And I think, you know, there's a couple of games. A lot of the games were in the battle, but there's a 15-minute spell probably in every game where we could say we got outmanaged. You know, we're coming up against world-class halfbacks in pretty much every game. And our young halfbacks are good and will be very good. Are we a good enough team to carry two young halfbacks managing through that? No. What could we have done? We could have stripped the game right back and said, let's go back to absolute basics. It's not going to be the most entertaining rugby of all time. But I think that would have made a difference. Um, I think sometimes, speaking to far more experienced coaches than me, who I do regularly, it's very hard to identify these things until you've lived them. So I will always give myself a kick before anything else. But um, once we made that reflection, we sat down as coaches, sat down as a group of players and nailed it down a bit and said, you know, who are we? What's our identity? What do we want to stand for? And I think the last seven weeks you've seen that shift um, and we've also started getting some players back on the field which has made a massive difference but you know the, the whole of 2023 um, really is is really my reflection because our availability of our key players and key positions has been atrocious and it's not this season hasn't been like the back end of last season because we lost the core group but actually the rest of the squad's been pretty healthy so we're not I think taking the volume out of the programme was the right call. I think we went a little bit too far with it and we've put a little bit more back in now. But um, this season, I mean, in this position now, we're only, we've only got three or four injured players, which is pretty standard for a premiership team. Uh, but that's, that's my honest reflection. Sorry. So in hindsight, looking back at perhaps the summer, the tweak to the programme then and perhaps the rotation within that programme, you would have done differently now you've, now you've lived through it. Yeah, well, yeah, without a doubt. I think, I, I, I think, like I say, we took too much out of the programme. I think we we're a little bit too scarred by all the injuries we had. You know, rugby is a, a rough, tough game at the end of the day, so there is a certain amount of um, training and volume you have to do and you have to commit to being physical. Um, so you have to have a certain amount in there. I think the, the rotation piece is, is, has been slightly... Uh, certainly the media ran with it for a little while. We did have the plan of doing that. We did that for the Prem Cup, the first few Prem games. Um, sail away, we did rotate. But post that, we, the bodies were out and we've pretty much run with the team that we've had in front of us since then. So actually, the, the sort of grand plan that we had of trying to trickle boys through and, you know, we've got, for instance, we've, we've got when fit, we've got five really good ball-carrying back rowers that ideally you could move around. We, we haven't been in that position until last week. Let's talk game plan, box kicking. <laughs> I know you all enjoy this one. <laughs> Look, looking at the stats, Gloucester actually kick one of the least in the league, with Northampton kicking the most. That Northampton kicked 70 more times in the league than Gloucester have. Are we, are we talking about perhaps accuracy of kicking and accuracy of chasing rather than volume? Well, interestingly, the premiership coaches, we've all crossed paths, played against each other. We've all got pretty good relationships. And once you've played each other twice... Um, there's, there's pretty good honest exchanges and, and we keep getting asked why we've stopped kicking the ball when that was a massive threat <laughs> of what we did. So I understand the thing around kick. We do kick the ball the least. This year, ironically, we have kicked the ball the least in the league um, and that was because we wanted to play with the ball more. I think, again, you end up with young lads running the show. You get caught somewhere between when we say let's attack more, it's attack smart and kick less. And, and there's, there's games without a doubt we should have run when we've kicked and we should have kicked when we've run. Um, but ultimately, rugby is where it is. And none of us set out to, as rugby coaches to go, we want to coach kicking and chasing the ball. But that is the best, what the best teams do. And Northampton this year, you know, their biggest thing they've taken forward is they kick the ball the most. And, you know, they box kick their way down the field. They kick the ball in the 22 you know, they, there's some attacking platforms, you know, in, in Europe and they're just nudging the ball through, get pressure, score tries. 
And, you know, Dallas is, that's the single thing he feels has, has taken them to the next level. Um, so it's not a, a Gloucester coaches thing that we want to kick the ball. That is, that's the way rugby is. And that's what the best thing, you know, when we play Bath, they're box kicking it on the halfway line. You know, Leicester did the same here. And that's, that's unfortunately, I, I don't say I love that part about the game, but that is where the game is. And, and we've seen what happens this year when you overplay your hand and you don't kick it. And, um, you know, again, it's, it's a tricky balance because I know nobody enjoys the kicking side of it, but that is ultimately a massive part of the game. And you've got to get the balance right, for sure. Um, but if you overplay your hand in the Premiership, if you try and play 10 phases in the middle of the field, defences are too good. You know, we love it when teams do that to us. Everybody, you, the more phases you play in the English Premiership, if you don't dam damage them in the first three phases, every phase you play, the percentages go up that you're going to turn it over or they steal the ball. And therefore, that's why if you lose momentum and you keep playing, which we have done numerous times, you put yourselves under massive pressure. And I guess that score we saw from Adam Hastings on the weekend, uh, Friday night, Oli Thorley chasing down the box, it forces the error, Adam runs in the corner. That's exactly the kind of pressure and, and where, where the box kick needs to land. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, that's, that's exactly it. And, and we had a couple where Johnny regathered the ball and got us out of trouble. And we've had a lot of tries scored against us. Uh, we've conceded a lot of tries off, um, you know, Saris at home was a big one. They didn't get one line break all game. You know, we, we got nine line breaks in that game and didn't finish a try. They didn't do one. They just kicked the ball, got it back, and they end up scoring and winning the game. So um, I understand it's not an exciting part of the game, and it's probably the biggest conversation I've had since I've been at Gloucester is always about the kicking, but that's not my love of the game. That is, unfortunately, where rugby is. I do think there'll be some rule changes. Um, like, I think the... For instance, the 50-22 was brought in to make people play rugby, but defences don't worry about that happening because it's such a skill. You know, you, you see probably, let's say, on average one a game, but def no defence coach worries about a 50-22. So the idea was you put that in, the wingers are going to start dropping because everyone's scared of that. No one's responded to that. What that's actually done is encourage people to kick the ball. So I think there will be law changes. I think that 90 seconds against Bath might influence uh, that as well. <laughs> But I think, you know, that's ultimately, until they make those law changes, um, that's ultimately, you know, what the game's going to look like. Lenny, let's bring you in. Uh, let's take your reflections on Gloucester Harbury's season so far, because winning the league last season definitely puts a little bit of a target on your back. But, but so far, the girls are, are standing pretty stern in that defence. Yeah, they definitely are. And a lot of it is learning curves for us as uh, coaching and support staff, because we went to June the 24th was the final and then the World Rugby decided, let's put a WXV tournament in for the players. So over the summer, the girls then went, we had 25 internationals away. Uh, and then we were very lucky to play our youngsters in the Prem Cup, and we, we went very well there. But to get the players back then, and, and it was a little bit of a stop-start going into the season, uh, but, but very exciting um, w where we're at. Um, and I just think it's talking to Skivs there about listening. It, it's, it's big on winning those collisions and we're happy for... So when we play against Bristol Bears, we knew that, that how they want to play. They'll play 15 phases without kicking the ball. And that for us was amazing because we take so much pride in our D and we were happy for them to do the 10, 15 phases. Now we're a side who like to play a bit of a territorial game they kick back, and then we come alive on the counter-attack. The game is very different in the women's game compared to the men's, and we always want to be one step ahead coming from the men's game into the women's game. So taking those learnings from everybody in the premiership, the coaching staff that we've... Uh, I've got a lot of guys who I listen to with the coaching. You know I've come to watch um, the training with uh, Skivs. He's gone... The, um, leading the session with his coaching staff, but also I appreciate so much Skivs coming up into the stand and talking and we're having real good, honest rugby conversations. And <clears throat> that, that's so big for us, Gloucester Hartbury as well. And perhaps one of the, the biggest wins of the season so far came on the weekend just gone. It was the top two, neither had kind of notched up an hour yet. Um, and... You, you were missing a few as well, so to go and, go and put in that performance w was a real statement of intent, wasn't it? Yeah, it definitely was, you know, and, and 
that's a Saracens team, an informed Saracens team. Uh, they've got world-class Red Roses players. Um, and, and going into that, we had a tough time, Skivs, just like you, with some injuries. And uh, at the moment, we're on 10, 10 injuries within that. Um, and, and then it was just... And we haven't really... We've gone six from six, and sometimes the girls, they're very different. They want a perfect picture all the time. And we went to Trail Finders the week before that, and I knew we had to rotate the squad because we went on a four-week bounce... Uh, we played the big game at, Har um, at Twickenham, and then week four, weekend just gone, was Saracen. So we knew we had to rotate some players in, and we went to Trail Finders. We had a bonus point win, but it was ugly. And the girls were very upset. You know, we're not performing. We shouldn't be this. We're the circus. We need to entertain. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, but we knew then that, this week was, was good, big going into the Saracens. Um, it's all about physicality, win those collisions, and just the mindset and that togetherness from our squad that we've got. Um, it, it was, it, it's making history out there, and um, we've not beaten, myself and James, we've not beaten a, a full-strength Saracens side ever. Last year we went up there, and um, we had a good result, but they had a lot of injuries, but that was a very good statement um, where we're at as a club. And you talked about the injuries there impacting the team. How do you get this team to, to peak when it comes to finals rugby? Because currently it looks like, you know, you're 13 points clear now of outside the playoffs. It's a strong position going into the end of the season. How do you make sure that team peaks when you get to the semi-final, final stage? It's very difficult because it's... Um, making sure you, a lot of it will be out of our control. Um, so we've got six weeks on the bounce now going into games, um, and then they're going away with the Six Nations, and it didn't help. We, it's amazing for us, but the Red Roses have just called 11 of our squad members into the Six Nations, which is amazing because we've got an 18-year-old, uh, a 19-year-old who have just gone in, and John Mitchell was raving about one of our players who's 19 years old and um, it's great to see so Tim just going back on that I think a lot of it will be how good the medics can sort them out just coming out to Six Nations but we know this six week block is huge for us week two we're going into Bristol Bears uh, then we got sale on double headers um, and then we got Exeter here um, and then we finish with Harlequins but just before uh, King's Home as well so really excited and just it's an honour to be here tonight and please, please just come down um, and, and support the girls. Uh, you made it a special final last year because it was at King's Home and having that crowd. So thank you. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> George, let's come back and look at the men's side of the, the campaign towards the end of the season. Four out of four in Europe puts us second seed. So that's a, a big opportunity for a, a good home, home run along the knockout stages. Semi-final of the Prem Cup. There's obviously the Premiership as well. What does, what does a good second half of the season now look like for, for you and your team? Yeah, I think you know, we, we've got um, one Prem game obviously this weekend and then there's an opportunity to have a rest because you know, we've been going 21 weeks now. Um, but look, we're, we're in the knockout stages of both those Cups. So... You know, that looks like we're going for those, you know, without a doubt. And I think with regards to the Premiership, you know, every every Prem game we play now is massive for us. You know, I think that's, um, say, we, we're guaranteed to be competing in those Cups, but we will be doing everything to, to win every Premiership game that's left and, and see where that leaves us. So I think from that point of view, obviously we are, as we've said, we're, no one's happy with where we are in the Prem. But as a group, we've marked down that we have an opportunity to do something about it. And that will be our goal within the Prem. Um, and obviously, those two cups we're going for. Let's switch topics slightly to recruitment retention. Um, we'll start with Lewis Rees because that obviously came out of the blue last week. Can you just kind of give a little bit of a, an idea of what that 24 hours was like? And it, it wasn't <laughs> over-dramatised in the press. It really was 24 hours. Yeah, it, no, it wasn't over-dramatised at all. Um, I think it was more of a surprise for Gats than me in the end because I had at least a bit of time. But look, Zam did say to me in the summer uh, his contract was up this year and, um, you know, we were 
in discussions, but we hadn't hadn't actually got anywhere yet. But he said in the summer the the one thing is, you know, I want to stay at Gloucester. I don't want to go anywhere else. Full stop. But the one caveat is, if the NFL come in for me, then I would like to take the opportunity. Um, I sort of smiled and said, "Yeah, if the NFL come in for me, I'm going as well." But <laughs> like, it, it, he, he, I thought we were joking. So, you know, I think I thought I taught that tongue in cheek a young man who loves, he does love American football. You know, as he said publicly, his dad that was his game, and um, you know, I just that was it. That was the end of that conversation. Um, and then come Monday week back, whatever it was, it seems like ages ago now, to be honest, because like we've we've got rugby to play. But yeah, he just came in and said, "Look, I've got this offer on the table. I have to go this week. I want to take it." And we had a good chat around, like, this, what's your future look like? Are you sure this is, you know, you're still right at the start of your rugby journey, albeit you've ticked a lot of boxes. I think he's, you know, the potential he's got, he's still got a whole level he could go to, and I, I voiced that. But I think what, for me, what, what he said to me personally was, you know, I, I went to Edinburgh um, knowing that's probably my last game of rugby. Um, or oh, sorry, he said it was my last game of rugby, not I thought it was. And he'd obviously, it was in his mind. And I think when someone says that, you're sort of sat there going, I'm not going to change your mind, am I? And he, he said, no, I've got to take this while it's on. And, you know, we, we've always done right by any player in Gloucester. There's no point. He's not gone to another club or anything like that. You, you know, you're not going to pin him down and say you're not going anywhere. So um, I pretty much sent him over to Brownie and said, all yours, mate, you let me know what happens. Um, and then they debated and negotiated and whatever happened, happened. And then uh, lunchtime, Tuesday, uh, well, Tuesday morning, I'm obviously trying to prepare the team. I was running around trying to find Luds as well, just to give him a, a, a heads up and can you give me a hand with this? But I couldn't find him. I'm trying to organise the coaches, trying to get everything set up and nipping to him from Brownie's office. And it was mental with lawyers and conversations and anyway long and short I got told uh, about I don't know quarter to 12 look this is getting done so I quickly rang Gats because I knew his Wales announcement was at midday and said you might want to just hold this announcement off <laughs> and uh, I said like Zam's leaving rugby and he said what the <laughs> and um, I said mate just delay your press conference I've got to tell the team now and you're going to have to solve your problem quickly and we'll catch up later in the evening which we did but yeah it was a whirlwind um but look let's hope he makes it in the uh nfl because it's, it's a good story for gloucester i think great um let's move on to who who might be in the building at season obviously thomas williams coming in uh val will have ruskin resigned um today um what can you tell us about recruitment retention at the moment um well look what i can tell you is i have to leave here at 7 45 because we have there is someone we're trying to sign who you'll all be pleased i leave at 7 45 if i get this done but we we've, we've been waiting for him to fly in and he cancelled last week due to a niggle and then he's in he's come in tonight so um I knew you'd be disappointed if I didn't show up, so I made sure I got here. But I, I, we, you know, there's a couple like that in the pipeline that are very exciting. I think Val committing is massive. Obviously, he hasn't played any rugby this year, but that was a conscious decision because he had that knee injury last year. You know, he, he battled through trying to get to the World Cup. He came back, it flared up. We could have tried to push him out there week on week, but it would have got worse and worse. So. You know, we, we did again what was right by Val, got him the surgery. Um, but as you can imagine, trying to keep Val here, you know, there's a lot of people with a lot of money to compete with. But ultimately, he's, he's chosen to stay, which is, um, which is great for us. Um, so happy days with that. Uh, and I think we can expect some, some re signings over the next, next couple of months or so as well, which is, which is good as well. Um, Sean, for, for Gloucester Hartbury, I guess your challenge is trying to keep over 20 internationals in your squad. Yeah, you're definitely right. And um, it, it, the big thing for me is just making sure those, those players are feeling valued. Um, I know James is going to be uh, a busy man over the next six weeks. Uh, because we're very different in the women's game, trying to ask a player to commit two, three-year contract because the salary cap is 
is different. Um, and it depends. A lot of them are on year-to-year -year contracts with their unions. Um, so it, it's very difficult and um, to have those conversations. But we're very big on making sure that the rugby program we provide at Gloucester Hartbury and having the, the facilities with uh, King's Home is uh, massive for us. And the coaching staff, Dan Murphy, um, Reese Oakley, and then Johnny Goodridge coming in and doing a lot of the skill work with the girls. It, it's, we just need to make sure that those girls feel valued in their rugby and they are becoming better players um, and making sure then the environment, who Mo Hunt is, is massive on that and driving those standards. And um, so, yeah. Uh, James has got a few conversations in the next six weeks, but um, fingers crossed there'll be positive news. And Skiffs, just before we welcome Alex and James to the stage, whilst we're on internationals, I think many of us in the room might have thought Gloucester would have had a few more players involved in the Six Nations, uh, notably what Zach in the room tonight. How much of your role as a director of rugby is kind of dealing with the disappointment from players when they don't get into that international stage? Um, I, yeah, I mean, it, there's a, there's a part. I think it's um, it's tough for any player, you know, when they don't get selected. But um, you know, my role is is really just to have a chat, try and hear the feedback, you know, talk about how we could potentially push them on and and get them, you know, higher honours. And um, that's an important part of it. But ultimately, you know, we've got good lads, and and Zach obviously, you know, has, has got a bit of heat for. Um, you know, showing some emotion, which I, I think is is mad, really, because everybody wants to hear people's opinions, and you want us to be honest, and you want players to be honest. And um, you know, I think Zach's very unfortunate not to be in the English squad. I think he's he's had a hard. Uh, there you go, Zach. <laughs> um, but I think you know, again, you know, I think it's important people show some emotion. I think if you know, if you take Zach's. As an example, there he's, he's come over here. You know, he's gone to a World Cup camp. He's been released at the last minute, um, and then come back to Gloucester with a, a spot on attitude, ripping to Gloucester, doing brilliantly well. Then he's got an injury. Had to watch, you know, a couple of months on the sideline, which is massively frustrating, especially knowing he could make a difference. And then come back, started playing really well, and and has you know had a phone call to say that you're not part of the plan. I think you know showing some emotion. Like if I didn't include a player, well, let's put it like this. I think, you know, I put Luds on the bench last week for the right reasons. But I think you saw his emotional response when he smashed a couple of Frenchies <laughs> for that. And, and that's what you want as a coach. If, if you leave someone out, you don't want them nodding along and saying, oh, OK, that's all good. Like if you don't see some emotion, then you've probably got an issue. So, um, you know, I, I'm very confident the more Zach's on the field playing for us that, you know, he'll be playing for England before we know it. Thanks, George. On that note, let's um, take uh, a moment to welcome Alex Brown and James Forrester to the stage, and we'll have a, have a chat to our CEOs. Obviously, my appointment was back in the summer, um, and I suppose I, I, over that period, I've been through a whole heap of emotions, um, from enjoyment, excitement, to frustration, to anger, um, to all of those challenging moments, but it's been hugely humbling, humbling for me. One of the things that I was really keen on doing when I when I took the role on was um, clearing out and a, a making sure that we all had a clear vision uh, and an understanding about what direction the club is going. I've been part of this club for nearly 21 years now, uh, a huge amount of time. Um, starting as a player, obviously, in 2003, so I've been through that player journey and understand what it is to put the shirt on and represent the club. Um, and then, obviously, in 2012, became injured and then worked my way through commercial roles and, and various bits. So I understand both sides now, which I think is unique in, in, in sport. But what is important is I think we need an aligned vision, an aligned vision for both on-field and off-field, um, joining the club as one, so that when we're going into battle, whether it's um, on the pitch or off the pitch, we're all very, very clear. So this vision is something that we put together with all those thoughts in mind over the course of the summer. Um, and I've got a bit of a video to show you just that encapsulates it. What's important in the video is you read the words because they do mean something. Um, this club is a special club um, and, and read the words if you can. 
So that's um, our vision um, to win for our community and each other. And, and I'll just dissect that a little bit for you. Um, the win bit is is really important. We are a rugby club, and and we've got to win things. Uh, we're not in here to make up the numbers. That's absolutely not the case. Um, and, but winning just isn't just on the field. It is off the field as well. Um, whether we're winning with a, a community appearance that delivers joy and happiness, or we're winning up here in Captain's Lounge with an outstanding meal, and you've all had a cracking time. Winning encompasses everything across the club. Uh, but primarily, this club is a community club. We are at the centre of a wonderful community, and I've been part of that community for, like I said, over 20 years. And it means something. It's something special. Um, and the responsibility that we have as a club to deliver for our community is really important. So that, that for our community piece is actually, actually really important as part of this vision. And it clearly it's for, for ourselves, the players, the staff, um, the commercial staff, the people behind the bars, everyone in this club, we're, we're doing it for them. So that, that um, vision was presented at the start of the season um, to everyone, both um, on-field and off-field. On-field, we're, we're not quite there yet. We've got some work to do, but I think I take um, great confidence in George and what he said just then, because it's wholly true. Thanks, Alex. And, and speaking on behalf of the commercial staff, I can attest to kind of the, the vision and the way that, that we're growing the culture here. I guess as CEO over the last... He had to say that, by the way. That was, that was a <laughs> plumbed in line. <laughs> as CEO over the last six months, obviously I've, I've spoken about the off-field stuff. We can't ignore the on-field on performance in the league. And, and you've had many people message you. How have you dealt with that and... And I guess, what do you say to those that, that are urging you to change something? Yeah, it's an interesting question, uh, Tim. I, um, I've obviously been at this club and, and former clubs um, before. I've been in international setups where I've played rugby and, and seen the best. We've, we've been part of, me and, me and James have been part of teams whereby we get to finals and we, we know what that winning feeling is. We, won't, we know what good is. We know what a good coaching group is. We know what a good team makeup is. Um, so I've seen, I've seen good, and I've also seen pretty bad. Um, I've seen a lot of bad over the past um, time I've been here. Um, I've seen a lot of um, change, um, and that's not been helpful. Um, and so my, my takings from all of that is, firstly, um, we need a solid, consistent coaching group, that's absolutely paramount, and that needs to be embedded with trust and respect, and I think George and the rest of the coaches are the, the, the group that are leading the way there. I, I absolutely have 100% support and faith in, in what they're delivering, uh, and the players, I think that they, they understand what this club means, uh, and they truly do, and, and if everyone understands that when when the team loses they really really hurt and you know we've got two guys here this evening Luds and Zach at the back of the room that I know will be testament to that because it really does hurt and um, they're trying their very best to make it right but to enact change would be absolutely the wrong thing to do um, we need some consistency and we've got the right people in the room so why would we change it thanks Alex James, let's, let's move on to you. Obviously, part of the, the vision that we're building here, Gloucester Harper are a massive part of that as well. And, and for those in the room, a lot of people might not be aware of, of the, the joint venture now between Gloucester Rugby and Harper to for this women's team. Can you just elaborate on, on what that joint venture looks like and what it means for our women's rugby going forward? Yeah, so um, I got involved a few years ago with Lenny. Uh, Lenny asked me to be forwards coach. Um, um, we were sort of there and thereabouts, and we kept finishing fifth. And we, we, and we had that season where I think we lost seven games in the last minute, and it was all the top of the league teams. And it was very, very painful. So, first thing I thought is, I need to stop coaching, first and foremost, because <laughs> um, that's not doing anyone any good. Uh, I thought maybe I could help in other ways. So, um, we, Lydia and I, and people around us, and Brownie, and the, the, the boards from both sides just felt there was a huge opportunity. We had this. Core of great players like some Mo Hunt, Zoe Allcroft, who is World Player of the Year, but yeah, we didn't have that sort of 
wider group around them. But what we did have was this amazing pathway at Harbury. Um, for those that don't know, we now have 240 girls playing in our under-18s and, and our Bucks program. So we, I, I don't think anyone would argue we've got the best women's pathway in the world. You can't really argue that. So we just felt this is a massive opportunity that if we could just get a bit more investment in, and sign a few of those sort of higher-end, particularly forwards, you know, trying to copy what we've done in the past at Gloucester and what I think George done really well, um, bringing some you know, forwards and that sort of forward play. There's just a massive opportunity. So uh, we worked hard. Um, we brought in some investment. We improved the programme. We invested in some players. Um, we have set up a, a new entity, which is Gloucester Hartbury Rugby, 50% owned by Gloucester Rugby, 50% owned by Hartbury College University. And we as a company are a 10% shareholder in PWR, which is the new league, which also just launched this summer. So it's been a lot of work. So um, what we've got now are these two amazing brands. As I said, Harbury College Uni, best pathway in the world, fantastic facilities down there as well. Gloucester Rugby, amazing, iconic rugby brand. All the expertise, you know, Linny can go and chat to George and watch the training. We get to use the new bar and we get to use the pitch. Um, and when you, and what we felt was when you combine those two things and maybe a bit more investment, when I say a bit, really just a bit, uh, we did have this massive opportunity and hopefully we've seen that, you know, the fruition, what, what we in the group and the players and the coaches achieved last year and in June and what we've carried on this year. So hopefully in, in a good place. And obviously last year's final here at King's Home was probably one of the most incredible occasions for a long, long time. What impact has that had commercially for Gloucester Hartbury and women's rugby within Gloucestershire? Well, first of all, I'd like to say I hope it had a massive impact on the community as well. Um, I've had some pretty good days at King's Zone, but I'd say that day in many ways topped it. Um, having 10,000 people at a game. I mean, we've got players who got their first caps for England in front of 50 people. So for them, walking into a home changer of King's Zone with their names on the back of the shirt walking out in front of 10,000 people, having the likes of Luds announcing the team on the video the week before. That was so new to them. That was just absolutely, you know, it was new ground. They just, if you'd asked them, they would have never expected to have that experience. So I think, first and foremost, that's amazing. Um, commercially, yeah, it, it has a, had a big impact. We've brought a lot of new sponsors since. Um, Rob sat at the front there, who's uh, kindly sponsored us, just spotted him. Thank you, Rob. Um, it's obviously brought the girls um, to the forefront um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, commercially, it's massive. I think investment's a lot about sentiment as well. And I think for companies and TV companies seeing 10,000 people at a final, it gives confidence, it gives that sentiment for them to invest. We've just done a deal with TNT, so we've got our own TV deal, which is massive as well. Thank you. And, and finally, before we move on to the Q&A, a question, I guess, for, for both CEOs. Double headers. What's the what's the thought on it? What's kind of the I guess the challenges with it? Alex, should we should we start from your side? Yeah, I, I, actually, I, I I do love the double headers here because they 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 offer obviously the, the, the blend of everything. The the challenges are, uh, are are difficult. We've obviously got one pitch and we've got two change rooms, so turnaround for for those sort of events is tricky. But, but, but mainly, I think, if, if we want the women to thrive, we need to give them their own platform to do that on. Um, when they're a tag on uh, to, a, to a men's game, whether that's before or after, um, I think it devalues the product, really. Uh, I think it, we're not giving them the setting to, to thrive and survive. And I, I think that we should probably, and we're, we're doing more of this, to do single standalone games whereby they have their own platform, their own fan base. Um, it's really hard for us operationally to manage someone who's bought a men's ticket and someone who's bought a women's ticket. And how do we how do we usher people in, usher people out? So it's, it's a logistical nightmare to do that. I, I do like them because it gives me the opportunity to watch two games in one day, which is great. Um, but I think for fairness um, for for the women and we want them to thrive and survive and go further. Um, let's give them their own platform. That's what my beliefs are. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. Um, I, think it's sort of, I think it's something we maybe do once a year, and I think it was a lovely tribute to Ed. We had the four Ed game, so I think it's something we'd target once a year, but as Brownie says, we want to give the girls their own platform. Also, as Tim was asking about the commercials, I think we sold eight or nine boxes for the final. 
So obviously when we have a men's game, that takes away all that opportunity. We can't, we can't do the community stuff on the pitch, and that's huge for us because our audience really is young females. It's a different audience. So we do a lot of that community stuff, coaching on the pitch, talks. So when you do the double header, you sort of take all that away. You take the ability to sell boxes, which hits us commercially. So I think it's a lovely thing to do as a club, maybe once a year, but as I think by and large, we'll do, do our own games. On that note, we will move towards the Q&A. We've got 20 minutes or so before Skiffs heads off to meet the unnamed player. Um, so if you want to start raising your hands for questions, we'll run microphones around. One right at the front, Nicole. George, can I ask where the guy's flying in from? <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> I'm sure there are some burning questions. Here we go. Hi, could I ask about the salary cap, please? Obviously, it's a, we've seen a lot of clubs fail in the last two, two or three years, which is very sad. Um, are we uh, going to pay, pay up to the sal new salary cap, or what problems do you see emerging from it? Do you want me to say that one? Skip. <laughs> yeah, so salary cap is, um, well, it's a, it's a bone of contention, isn't it? Um, the salary cap, obviously, as you know, over COVID got reduced to five million quid. Um, but plus all the extras, it's, it's way more than that. And, and you can end up spending six, seven, uh, seven and a half million. Um, it is set to go back up to 6.4. Um, that's not going to change uh, next year, plus all the extras and bits and pieces. At this time, we pay to salary cap. We are on our cap. Um, and that's an ambition that, from my perspective, I'd like to maintain. I'd like to, for us to be a club that consistently pays up to salary cap, but is sustainable at the same time. Uh, and that's the, that's the challenge. I, I am not going to be responsible for putting this club down. There, there is absolutely no way that's happening. So I need to act responsibly as CEO and make sure that we allocate the players, the playing staff, enough budget to, to perform, um, but be very mindful of the fact that we can't overstretch that and we can't push it too far. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tricky balance because I'm acutely aware that um, if we spend more, ultimately George gets a, a, a squad that is, uh, which, he, which he really wants. Um, but it is a balance and, and it's, it's, it's striking the, the right balance there that's important. One in the middle, Katie. So, uh, Alex, this is one for you, really. G given that the, the last published accounts showed a 17 million turnover and a loss of over £600,000, and now with fewer home games because of the Irish and, and, and Worcester, how, how is the, the business, the company, going to be sustainable? <coughs> Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question because that's exactly the, the model I'm, I'm, we're working to. Um, the reduction in salary cap was the start um, for us to start that sustainable journey. Uh, that clearly isn't continuing, and so we need to be mindful of that. As I said, we need to try and bring in more supporters, bring in more sponsors, make sure that we, we, we are able to spend more. What's changing in, in 2024 has been widely sp spoken about, and I I'm not going to get into the, the exact details because the agreement's not quite done yet, but there is a new um, agreement with the RFU, um, Premiership Rugby and the clubs, this central uh, agreement that ultimately pays centrally more money to each club. Uh, and that, 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 that central money was really important, uh, and it's been a, a, a long negotiation battle and it's still not quite finalised. Hopefully by the end of next month we'll have that, that paper all signed and sealed and, and it will see us hopefully become sustainable. But as I said, it's striking the right balance between paying the players ultimately and, and the revenues that we bring in centrally as well as what everyone in this room contribute to, um, the, the commercial income the club brings in. Um, so, uh, you know, you're, you're a, a great testament to the success of this club by your investment. Um, and we need to continue that and we need that to, to grow uh, in order for the, for the playing squad to grow. Is there any more hands? Can I ask, is it possible that 
Sorry. Sorry. Can I ask, is it possible to get the sevens tournament back in the summer? I love that you're saying that. Um, and you, we had an off-site meeting only at the start of this week, and we spoke about what's been and gone, what worked, what didn't. Um, and I love the sevens. I thought it was cracking. It's a cracking day in the summer. Um, sevens um, for pre-season is a great opportunity for the players to go out and demonstrate what they do. But it's also a great thing for the supporters to come along and support. So watch this space on that from a club perspective. I can't speak centrally because that's a, it was a premiership rugby uh, sevens tournament before. Um, I'd love it if they brought it back and you know I'll be beating the drum to try and make sure they do because I thought it was a cracking cracking piece it was jammed here and and we had we had uh, a, a great almost festival of rugby um, so leave it with us it's a, it's a great thought isn't it all about finance if you look at the um how on earth, I love your talk about the community spirit, but how can you compete with Racing 92 in Europe when they're, they're signing Owen Farrell, um, I forget, CC, either the South African captain flanker? It's going to be quite difficult. Do you keep yourself as an English premiership club or how far do you compete in Europe? Well, actually, I, I think you're right. I mean, the salary cap in, in France is of a different level, um, and you've seen some players um, head over that way. I still think um, the premiership competition, particularly this year, has been at its level best. I, I really do believe that. Um, the three clubs that, that left the league last year, it was a tragedy for that to happen. And um, we're all very, very sad about them leaving for lots of reasons. But what it did do is it enhanced every premiership team because those, those clubs had some top-end players that then were dispersed amongst the 10 teams. And we picked up a few. Um, every club did. And what's happened is that their programs have just been enhanced and improved. Um, so I think the Premiership is in good shape. Uh, I think you've seen that in the European competition recently, whereby Premiership clubs are really performing well. I thought, and I hate to say this, but I thought Bath did reasonably well against... <laughs> I hate to say it. Um, they did reasonably well against Toulouse, and Toulouse are, you know, they are um, serial European champions, and uh, it was a credit to them-ish. Um, but your point's right, it's, it's challenging. I think that the most important thing that we hold in this, in this competition is we make it mandatory that the, the players who want to play for England has to play in this country. Um, and that just enhances the, the product here. It makes um, our, our, our English team better. And ultimately, that's the goal from a club's perspective, is to provide for our national team. And we've got to get this English premiership full of great English players that then make our country uh, a brilliant a brilliant team and a force to be reckoned with. We did. We should have won that one. <laughs> Alex, a question for you. Um, about a month ago, 8,500 of us trooped up to Twickenham for a game. About 11,000 Harlequins were in that crowd. That makes 17,000, 18,000. There were 76,000 people at that club, at that ground that day. What did we get out of it commercially? Well, um, I, I love your question because I thought actually that whole day, that whole experience was absolutely cracking. I, I mean, from a club rugby perspective, if you're looking at the premiership and saying uh, what a great product the Premiership is, that day was was uh, absolutely knockout. And, and it is credit to Quinns that they, they put that on and managed it the way they did. How many of you went to that game? Yeah. Quite a few. Okay. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you all enjoyed it as much as we did. We clearly didn't get the result at the end, but um, the, the whole day was, was tremendous. And Quinns have been doing this for 12 years now. 
um, 12 years at, at Twickenham. I mean, they're bloody lucky to have it right on their doorstep, which is, which is uh, you know, fortunate for them, but they do have that ability. But the commercial income from it, um, we get nothing from that. Uh, that that's, that's their home game. That's the equivalent of, of us doing it somewhere else or our home game, so we get nothing. And, and, and that's my point. They would have made a fortune out of that game. We, we and the rest of the West of England clubs don't have access to an 80,000-seater stadium, apart from the principality. So is there a plan to even up the commercial um, aspect of the game? I'm not worried about the game itself. Yeah, I'm sorry we lost and all of that. But we are losing out, and a lot of small... of Sorry, a lot of clubs are losing out because we haven't got Twickenham on our doorstep. We haven't got uh, Spurs Stadium on our doorstep. How, how can we compete with that when they've been doing it, as you say, for 12 years? No, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult challenge. And, and, and I think they're the one club who do have that luxury. I don't think many, many more do. Um, and, and as I said, they've been doing it for 12 years. Look, I, I think that that um, model of going to a big stadium is something that um, we've got to look at because it, it is exciting. I'd be interested to, to hear from you all about whether that would be something that you'd all be interested in us lo looking and exploring because there are opportunities for us to maybe maybe do that and have that one-off um, extravaganza day that, that celebrate the, both the women and the men's game. Um, so be interested to hear from you on that. And actually, that brings me to a separate point about um, feedback uh, and, and, and sort of um, understanding your thoughts. We're actually going to put out after this um, evening tonight a, a survey just about how the evening was. Hopefully you enjoy it. Um, and also just some uh, questions about what you think you can improve because I really want to hear from you. It's, it's really hard to decipher um, through um, the various forums that I see um, some, of the, some of the real... <laughs> some of the real messages and the key ones that are actually going to drive this club forward, not be a, a barrier and be negative. I really want some positive thought about how we can drive. And, you know, you, you live and breathe it. You're passionate enough to come here tonight uh, to share your views and to listen. You're passionate enough to go up to Edinburgh. I, that, that was unbelievable. That was, that was something special. I, I, I've never been to a, a, a match um, an away match like that where I think half the crowd were ours. It was phenomenal. It was, it was cracking. So we're lucky to have you all and we, we really do a, a cherish you, but we also need to hear from you. So we're going to put out a survey just for this group because you're the ones who made it here tonight and, and, and have got the seats um, uh, about what, what, we, what else we can do. So I'm, I'm really keen to hear from you all. Oh, got one at the back. Ask to Skivs, because he's got to go in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, George, please tell us. Give us a clues or something. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Question for Alex, if I may. Um, obviously, we've got fewer clubs in this league now, um, and I think we're all passionate about seeing English rugby grow. Um, can you just confirm that the club are you know, reluctant, shall we say, to pursue an enlarged league with maybe Welsh regions in it or other clubs outside of England? I mean, that, that um, it's an interesting point because I, I, I do see the benefits of all of that. Um, but what I see the, the major benefit in is a bit of stability. Um, we've had, over the past three years, uh, a, a really rocky, rocky ride. Um, covid damaged the club beyond uh, immeasurable ways. You know, the, the, we lost three, three really big clubs over that period, and I'm, I'm sure there were other clubs that were very, very close to it as well. Um, so what we, what we absolutely need is not any more chopping around. We need, we need some stability and understanding. This is our league, and this is what we've got, and let's get behind it and support it. So I think we need to just leave it alone and stop meddling for the moment and, and let it settle. And then we can go, okay, well, let's develop and let's grow, uh, grow slowly. One of, the, one of the key messages that I, I said as in my role now to all the staff was we've got to do less but do it better. Um, we're, we're, we're a club that presents so many opportunities to do lots of wonderful things. 
Um, but if we deliver rubbish, we'll end up getting rubbish. We've got to just deliver quality. And I think that if we start messing around with things now, um, it's just going to distract on, on what is a cracking, cracking tournament. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Sean, Alex, and James are going to stay in the room. We've got Lewis Ludlow and Zach Merce in the room as well, so, so please go and have a chat with them. And uh, um, we will shut the doors at half eight, so we've got 45 minutes or so for you to, to mingle and have a chat with those guys. I, I, I'll just say before I go, um, but look, I, I appreciate we're all frustrated with where we are in the league. Like, there's no, again, I, hopefully you know me well enough and those who know me well, I'll never make an excuse for it or pretend it's okay. But I think it is important to know that how hard the group are working, the, the coaches, the staff. I'll echo what Brownie said. Through this whole club, there is unbelievable people in the building, really good people, particularly the players. Like this year of uh, 2023 that I started talking about here has been a massive year of adversity. Like we just got kicked and kicked and kicked. And we won't ever use it as excuses. Publicly, I'll never go down that route. But the group keep coming back and... If the, the players don't probably realise how tight they are and how much they've just come back and back, and I think you see that in the performances recently, there's, there's no way they would turn around the last two weeks if it weren't an unbelievably tight group. And the staff are in relentlessly. There hasn't been many days off in the last couple of months, believe me. And everybody keeps turning up and working unbelievably hard. And I understand frustrations. We're all frustrated, but you can rest assured this group, it will come through and the adversity of this year will definitely hold us in good stead because the players particularly have been unbelievable and I think um, there's no doubt of, of what they put out there week to week and, and that will get better and we are not a million miles away um, and it will come through. But thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>